I'm continuing a series of videos that I'm making talking about how I turned my webcomic that I posted my website into a published book and ebook. So I wanted to talk more about how my webcomic transformed into something that was more than just something I posted on my website. It was a thing that I could find multiple uses for. Now, when I draw the comic, I know that it's going to be used for something that I would publish as also a book and put it on multiple media websites, like webcomic sites. When I started out, it was just something I drew and posted. And now I draw one thing and it's being turned into several things at once. In the last video I did, I talked about how the three books I published of my web comics were all different sizes. So I have the big one, the medium one, and then I have the small one, which is the current one, or the last one that I did before the one that I'm starting to publish now. When I first started drawing the comic, I was just posting it on my website. So I just kind of picked a size and it was a large rectangle and it was like a comic page. It was about the size of one and I just went with it and I had no real thought behind it. This wasn't a problem at the time, but I wasn't thinking ahead. I wasn't thinking about how the comic would transform to other sites and mediums and be available in different ways. There were things I could do to fix this when I used it on, in these other ways or on different sites or publishing it, but it would take extra work. It would take manipulating what I had and then creating several different versions of it. So I decided I wanted to find a route that for me was smarter rather than working harder for myself. And it kind of progressed this way. At first, I found a few webcomic sites. I began posting them there because I wanted to try and put them in a place where people were actively looking for what I was doing. Uh, kind of, for an example, kind of like creating an Etsy store uh, for handmade items. If I make something that's handmade, I put it on Etsy because I know people are going to Etsy to look for handmade items. So I wanted the similar sort of thing for webcomics, webcomic sites where people were going to look for webcomics. Uh, and I could cross post to that instead of trying to find people and bring them to me. So that's why I started posting to webcomic sites. One of the first ones I started using was tapas.io. And that site lets me post images there that are a maximum of 940 pixels wide. And I like tapas. I still post there. I still post to all these webcomic sites that I'm going to talk about. But uh, they offer a monetary reward system. And uh, they also share ad revenue on the site. When you sign up, you can get ad sharing. If you get more people to view a comic, when I do that, I get more ad revenue. It's kind of like the same way with people visiting a site that has ad revenue on it. So that part's really cool. Also, a side note on this, and it's something that I just I think about, it's uh, they also have on the webcomic site a section for authors, for stories, for just readable text, for people writing stories. So people can post their own stories or their own like, series or released a chapter at a time. So like they don't need to do artwork. They can actually just write stories instead of just web comics. It's also for writing. So that's kind of cool. And they get the same monetary support value and all that kind of stuff on tapas. And I think that's pretty cool. Plus a lot of the artists that I follow, a lot of the comic strip artists or web comic artists that I follow will post sometimes just like drawings that they did or a new character they're working on or a sketch that they did of a character when they don't have a comic and they'll post that to their page. And it, it makes me wonder, like, why don't more illustrators just post on there? I mean, do you really need to have a web comic? This is just a question I'm wondering in my head. It, and you'd get the same sort of fan base, people going there looking for artwork. I mean, a lot of it is for the artwork, even though it's for web comics, people also enjoy the artwork that people do. So I'm surprised I don't find a lot more illustrators on there posting stuff and collecting the ad revenue, finding fans. That's just a thought that I had in my head. I actually just thought of that while I was talking about this. Webtoons also has a maximum size for the comic that you can do, which is 800 pixels. So it's a little bit smaller than the 940 pixels on Tapas. So still trying to figure out the size here for my comic at this time. Uh, Webtoons also has, by the way, a ad sharing program, but it's more like the way YouTube does it. You have to have a certain amount of followers to apply to be in it, and then they'll let you know if you're approved or not. Then on top of that, I had started using Instagram actually about maybe halfway through doing the first book, and the size I used for the webcomic at that point in time in the big honkin' book was very large. 
a lot of the time the top or the bottom would get cut off. So I needed to start rethinking what size my comics should be. But I wanted it to be still in this rectangular format and not in a square short format. I didn't want to change it that dramatically. So now, just to get where I'm at in this point when I'm trying to find the dimensions for the book that I use and what size comic I should use, now I had three different sizes I had to choose from. I needed a size that would work with all of these different places and also still look good on the website. I was looking for something that was still kind of a long rectangular shape. I decided to go with the format that would work best with Instagram and then I'd figure out a way to work it with these other formats and also the book. The size I ended up going with is uh, 1000 pixels wide by 12,000 pixels high. So a little wider than the webcomic sites that I post to. And there's a reason for that, and I'll get to that in a second. So I messed around with a few different sizes. And when, like I said, when I originally started the book, the first book, it was a lot larger. I think it was like 1,200 by 1,600 pixels. I draw the comic in a program on my tablet called Medibang Paint, which is the one that has the comic book kind of presets already. It also helps me create uh, the panels for it really easily. I draw it at a resolution of 300 pixels, which is also, thinking forward, a good pixel rate for print. So it'll make it look a lot cleaner and crisper and, you know, it'll come, it won't be pixelated. So I know I said that I chose a larger size than the webcomics. I could use it out of the box for Instagram, but how was I making it easier to post to these webcomic sites? Well, it's because I found this easy trick. The whole backing up my comics to Google Photos thing, like I said in the last video, turned out to be a good thing once again. I found a trick that I could use to size them for these webcomic sites. When I opened up the albums that I would save my comics to for constructing the book later on, which I had mentioned in the last video, I can actually use Google Photos itself to resize the image in the browser really, really easy. And it's super fast. And it's, I just, all it takes is really just right clicking, change something, boom. Then I can download a different size. So I open the most recent image. I right click on it. I open it, that image in a new tab, and in the address bar at the top, there's a size in the URL. It's way over on the right. So I find that, and I change the URL in that section to, for the first one, which is the 940, I put in W940, replace the size in there with that, and that's the width for tapas. And then I hit enter and I download that, and then I would switch it again to W800, hit enter, and download that for the Webtoons site. And I can actually change it to any size. It doesn't have to be these sizes. It will do any size of the image that renders below the maximum size, which is why I did it at 1000. So I could shrink it down to these other sizes and the 1000 width size works on Instagram. It renders the photo and resizes it just like it would in Photoshop or GIMP or any other image editing software. I really love this trick. It's something I've been using for so long. I don't even remember how I figured this out or where I heard about it, but I've been doing it for as long as Google Photos has been around and I use it for so many other things, but this is how I use it for the webcomic itself. So after these sizes, I also had to mess around with the size of the book because now uh, I was putting them in this large book, but they got smaller towards the end. And you can even see as I was messing with the size here, it's starting to get smaller and I've got this big extra section down at the bottom. I had also during this time printed a few like zines at home out of uh, folded sheets of paper and a folded sheet of paper is eight and a half by five and a half. So the second book that I published was eight and a half by five and a half in size based on that. And it was all right, I didn't mind it, it was okay, but there was still a little extra space. It kind of was doing the same sort of thing as the last one, whereas I had, I had a bunch of white space underneath. I had shown in the last video too, I collect a lot of these comic strip paperback books from like the 70s and 80s where they would take newspaper comics and put them in a collected sort of book so I went over to KDP and I looked for the smallest size they had. And that smallest size was eight by five. This is the smallest type of book you can get. I showed you in the last video, I dragged the folders from Google Photos into the Google Doc that I uploaded from the KDP template. And I filled in all the months for the past year. So they're ready for me to download from Google Docs and get ready to upload to Amazon KDP. But still, I have one more thing to do before I do that. I mean, of course, I still need to create the cover. I, I have all the pages, I have all, I've been doing all this work, and then at the end, it's like, oh, but I still need to create one more thing. So, I don't know why, 
but this part is always the most, it makes me the most anxious. I get the most anxiety about this. Uh, maybe it's because it's the way the book is going to be represented. It's the first thing that people see. When regardless, I'm like telling very personal things in the webcomic themselves, but the cover is the thing that's making me anxious. I mean, this is gonna be what I show when I say to people, hey, I created this book. You should check it out. Maybe I'm being silly, I don't know. Again, what I did to uh, kind of help me with this is I would reference the old comic strip books that I have. I mean, I like the styles of these books. I collect, uh, I have shelves of them back here and I, I like the way they look. I, I like having them around. I, I just like to open them and go like, oh, that's really neat. I mean, they knew what they were doing. They put a lot of these together. So why not kind of just reference this and do what they did. Over on KDP, what I did too, is I downloaded the cover template that they had. And I really just do this to figure out the layout because they have things they put in there like the ISBN barcode. I just need to know where the bleed areas are. It's going to be eight by five because like the pages inside, the cover is gonna be around that same size. KDP actually has a cover making tool built into the upload process because the cover making tool, when I upload it to that, it will tell me if there's any formatting issues or if something is blocking something or if it's not gonna show up when they cut it for print. It's kind of really like a catch all for mistakes. One of the questions I got asked when I started recording these videos is if KDP is a print on demand. So the answer is yes, paperback books are on demand on KDP. When I upload them, they are only made when people buy them. They will sit there, the files are sitting on the server and when they're ordered on Amazon, then the printer gets them, they print the book and put it together. Amazon takes care of the rest. So the printing and the shipping, that's all covered by Amazon. I don't have to do anything. And also I get an author page. So on top of that, when I create a book on Amazon, I automatically get an account as an author. So I have a, when I do more than one book, I can send people to my author page and it will show the books that I have and people can scroll through and see all of them or I can have a link to that from my website. On top of it being print on demand, I think I also mentioned in the last video, uh, I don't have to just sell my books on Amazon. If I wanted to, I could buy my own books, have them shipped to me, I can sell them in person or I can take care of shipping and posting and setting up a page for it on my own website to sell it from. I can order author copies. It's a button that's right next to the book that I have and I can choose which one. And I can order up to 999 copies of the book at the printing cost that Amazon has rather than the markup and the royalties and everything else that they take care of. But I also have to pay for shipping. So that part kind of sucks, but it's still a better price and I can mark it up for whatever I would like it to be when I get it sent to me. I also mentioned in the last video that KDP offers a thing called expanded sales. Expanded sales have the possibility for my book to be bought and sold and traded and ordered in bulk purchases for stores and libraries. So I know it sounds crazy, but I've actually had that happen. The first two books, I think, I set up for expanded sales and the first one actually got sent to a library and a store or a couple of them. I don't remember. It was a few years ago, but I would get these notifications of sales and it would say expanded sales. And it's like, oh yeah, that's right. I checked that and I look into it and it's like, oh my God, it got sent to like on the West coast somewhere, a couple of bookstores bought it. That was kind of neat. Problem is, is the royalties are much smaller when doing it this way. So, uh, and I'm assuming that's because of the added shipping cost and putting it in a catalog and whatever else they have to do, I'm sure it's it's not that lucrative of, of an option, but it's still pretty neat to think that the book that I make is available in other stores and libraries. So now I have my cover, I have the interior of the book. So in the next video, I'm going to go over more what happens during and after the uploading process and also making the print book available as an ebook. And on top of that, since my book is a web comic and it has frames, it has the ability to make the ebook on the Kindle, one of those swipeable books. So where you read it frame by frame. So reading it and then one frame will show up full size and then you swipe and then it'll go to the next square of the comic and then the next one. It's kind of a cool feature and that's something else I can do with the fact that this is a web comic book. And uh, it's not that hard. It's, it's, there's a tool to create it. So I'll go over more of that in the next video. I hope you're enjoying these and let me know if you have any questions or comments about what I've talked about in this video or the previous one or anything else you'd like to know that I haven't covered. And I'll see you in the next video when I upload my book.